little power here. We don't see see too much. Yeah, there's really not much. Not much epidermis. Yeah, basically see. none. Yeah, <laughs> or none. Um, mainly this kind of pale blue, purple um, infiltrate of cells that look pretty similar. They don't look pleomorphic from this power. This type. They look pretty decently circumscribed. And the cells have the pretty abundant cytoplasm with sort of this granular appearance to them. Yeah. So what's the diagnosis? Granular cell tumor. Yeah, it's a granular cell tumor. And these can kind of break the exception, the exception of the rule that sometimes it can be very large, mm -hmm. but they're still benign. Um, what kind of differentiation is this really exhibiting? What, what, uh, what's the origin of the brain of the cell tumor? What kind Just of the, cells are these? What kind of differentiation would you call this? Obviously granular mm -hmm. cell, but what, why are they? What, what are the cells that have the granules within them? Is it called, I think it's called um, hmm. and they're actually, It's actually a neural neoplasm. I mean, it used to be thought That's to be right. muscle. Okay. And it's, it's Schwannian differentiation. Schwannian. And so basically there are lysosomes that contain uh, myelin breakdown products within them that gives the granular cell morphology. So if you wanted to do an, a special stain to kind of determine, if you really weren't sure what this was, what kind of stains could you do here? Like yeah. There's two that we commonly use. Maybe that's cheating. No, I'm not. I was going to write down notes. <laughs> <laughs> not look at um, Stains like Udinum? Or neuron specific? Actually, not, that that's not a good one for this. No. That's kind of more for uh, mm -hmm. sort of more with the stain with cells that you see, like with uh, neuroendocrine differentiation. But it does stain with S100 protein very strongly. And also because these are myelin breakout products inside the cells, it'll stain positively for PAS stains. Okay. So those are the stains that you want to do. Let me show some pictures of it. And then uh, it's very common on the tongue, and it's also one of the more common benign neoplasms seen in, in dark skin patients, like African American individuals. So it's it's benign. It doesn't really even have to be excised. Now there are some other situations where you can see. I guess NSE can be possible. I've never ordered it on this. Um, there are some other situations where you can see granular cells. You can granular cell morphology, but it's not a granular cell tumor. You guys know any of those? So just like we can get certain reaction patterns in the skin, like spongiosis and Acanthalysis, that kind of need granular cell reaction patterns. So it look granular, but it's not really a granular cell tumor. <laughs> like in a fibrous papule, so you need granular cell fibrous papules, granular cell atypical fibrous anthomas. Occasionally see granular cells in lyomyelitis. So in dermatofibromas, sometimes you get some granular cells occasionally. So there's, a, there's about seven or eight different entities where you can see granular cell histology, but it's not a granular cell tumor. So just kind of remember that. When do you consider a granular cell tumor malignant? It has to have the criteria of a malignancy in general. It has to be very asymmetrical. It's a lot of mitotic figures, pleomorphism. So you, but they can be very deep and large and still be benign. So that's definitely good. OK. We have, um, I would call this a cyst. Yeah, um, it's a cyst in a way. It's got a line, it's got a little cystic morphology here, and it just has a lining to it. Mm -hmm. And inside the cyst, uh, there's kind of these glandular structures um, kind of forming these kind of fronds. Um, they have little um, papillae. Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. And then what kind of differentiation is seen on the surface of the fronds? Uh, I think it's apricot. Yeah, apricot. Excellent. Little snouts here, kind of decapitation secretions, blebs up here. So good. What else do you see in this thing? Um, in the middle, there's uh, some some dark cells. I was trying to decide if these were uh, lymphocytes. I think some of them might be plasma cells. Yeah, a lot of them are plasma cells. In fact, kind of almost all of them are. Yeah. Good. So what was your diagnosis? So it was between um, HPAP and SPAP. And I think that SPAP is supposed to have more plasma cells than in the fibrous centers, and then also it kind of commonly, more commonly opens to the surface. Well, yeah, and that, that actually looks kind of like a verrucous lesion. This really does look more like a cyst, like you said. That lesion tends to be a little bit more kind of horizontally oriented, where this is more kind of vertically oriented. Um, yeah. And so the plasma cells are seen in both. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really a criterion for diagnosis, so don't use an ancillary feature as a main criterion. But if you were in that general category, that's good. But this one has more of a cyst type morphology, whereas the other one is more kind of a, a plaque warty type of morphology. That's really the only main So more age pattern. Yeah. And where are these generally located in the body? Um, the genital area. Yeah, genital area. And this probably, this could well be the genital area. It's probably the person sure. So it, it is from the vulva, we know that, but it would be kind of tough to, be, to tell for sure just based on this histology where it's from. Uh, what condition is a syringocyst adenoma papillofrum usually associated with? Uh, nevus sebaceous. Yeah, and there's no nevus sebaceous here. Again, that's not a criteria for diagnosis, but that would sort of favor the adenoma papillofrum. I think we have a photo of it here. So there's an example of what this looks like. So what other kind of cysts do you know that you might see on a board exam that they might throw up there to kind of try to, to confuse you? Uh, that are like apocrine cysts? Or? Well, what if they put something like a median Rafe cyst of the penis on there? You're looking at this saying, they couldn't be that because I know what that would look like. What would that look like? I'm actually not sure on that one. Okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> I don't that know. Is what good. Like Anybody that. know? Isn't one of the ciliated cysts? It, no, 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 usually it has more GU epithelium, <laughs> like a oh, transitional, transitional epithelium. It's like a small, it's a small thin, uh, thin line cyst, so it wouldn't have anything like this. There is a type of cutaneous ciliated cyst, and that actually can look like, again, it's a very thin lining with cilia on the surface. It might somewhat look a little bit like that. Like a bronchogenic? Yeah, like a bronchogenic cyst. That can have like respiratory epithelium or stratified squamous epithelium with some uh, respiratory epithelium or even uh, pseudostratified columnar. So you can see some of those features in those kind of cysts. So I recommend that you bone up on those less common cysts mm -hmm. for the board because they might ask something like that just to kind of throw you off and try to confuse you. Do you have a good LA to remember differences between bronchogenic and bronchial? Because those get frequently confused. You know, uh, the bronchogenic, uh, the, they, sometimes there's some overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, the bronchogenic cysts, probably all of those are bronchial cleft, but they're the ones that generally have the uh, respiratory epidemic. Mm -hmm. And of course, you see things like uh, thymus in there, or you see thyroid, you know, those are also things that can kind of help you with bronchial cleft cysts. All right, that's a beautiful example of this entity. Um, so I thought that the um, changes were in the dermis. Good. Um, there was infiltrate, um, and it was patchy throughout. Um, more prominent, uh, more superficially, um, closer to the epidermis, but the epidermis is spared. Um, and and go down to this area too, so it's kind of superficial and deep. Mm -hmm. Not all the way to the fat, but it's certainly you know, lower, upper mid, uh, upper 
your particular dermis area. So it's, it's I call this by superficial need or superficial need. Superficial need. Um, mm -hmm. I thought it, um, there is a perivascular um, yeah. infiltrate. Um, and on higher power, I thought it was uh, primarily lymphoid. What about at low power? Um, yeah, I mean, the color looks like <laughs> it was too. So they look jet black like this at low power. Yeah. It's almost always lymphocytes. Okay. So that's good. Anything um, else that you saw here? I, what Maybe I, you didn't see. Um, I didn't see any spongiosis. Yeah, there really was very little involved in the epidermis at all, right? Mm -hmm. No um, little interface change, no spongiosis, mm -hmm. no thickening of the basement membrane zone. Um, I thought I saw a little mucin. Yeah. Quite a bit of mucin mm -hmm. right here. So you don't really need a colloidal iron stain to identify mucin. It's visible readily with H&E. If anything, it tends to be very, very sensitive stain and it picks up any glycosamine glycans in the dermis and it tends to get overinterpreted. So if you do it on normal skin, it'll be positive. So I, I almost never order the stain. To me, it's kind of confusing it, and it gets overinterpreted. You can say, oh, there's mucin here, and then they try to push somebody down the category of lupus. And the next thing you know, you've got a 25 year old woman who may have mild rosacea carrying around a long term diagnosis of LE. So I, I'm cautious about the use of the colloidal iron stain. But there is mucin here that you can see. So what was your differential diagnosis? Um, I thought about, initially I was thinking about vasculitis just because I thought there's a lot of um, like perivascular infiltrate. But, um, okay, now how do you tell the difference between perivascular inflammation and real honest to goodness vasculitis? Um, What's the histologic criteria for the diagnosis of bona fide vasculitis? Doesn't have to be leukocytoclastic vasculitis. Okay. Um, there's two elements of it. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, okay. Affinity for the, for the vasculature for sure. Um, but I don't know if that's criteria exactly. Exactly. It's not. Because you can get perivascular inflammation yeah. in a lot of things where there's no true inflammation of the blood vessel. Fibrin deposition. Fibrin in the wall of the blood vessel and or thrombi in the lumen of the blood vessels. Okay. For small vessel vasculitis. Now that doesn't say anything about the type of inflammation. Because you get lymphocytic you know, vasculitis rarely in about three diseases. You get lymphocytoclastic vasculitis in about 100 diseases. So you get thrombotic vasculitis. You can call, that, you can call it vasculopathy, but it is vasculitis because it is inflammation. You get septic vasculitis. So these are all forms of, of real inflammation of the blood vessel as part of the process. And then if you get a large blood vessel, all you have to do there is really have inflammation in the wall of the blood vessel. I mean, primary or secondary, you don't really have to have fibrin in the wall of a large blood vessel because it's not normal for inflammatory cells to go in and outside of like an artery. So if it's inside a large vessel, or even a medium-sized vessel, that, that's important. So this is not really vasculitis, is it? No. No. Is there um, any fibrin or any thrombosis mm -hmm. or anything like that? Uh, with all the mucin, I thought about lupus. Um, okay, good. Which type of lupus? There's about five or six types, right? Yeah, with the patchiness, um, tumid. The tumid form, which is mostly perivascular inflammation like this with lymphocytes and mucin deposition with no epidermal involvement. The tumid form, good. What does that look like clinically? Um, it's usually a photosensitive um, distribution um, and like plaque like. Yeah, they're kind of non-scaly, indurated, reddish plaques or, or papules or nodules, and I think we have a picture of it. Um, yeah, so it's a classic example. What other disease clinically looks very much like this and histologically looks very much like this? Almost identical. In fact, in my opinion, it probably is part of the same spectrum. Mm, histologically. Um, so we'll read my mind here. Oh, yeah, does nice. Well, Yesner's um, usually, it may not be a real disease, it's probably a wastebasket of about five diseases thrown together, but there is one entity that looks exactly like this, clinically and histologically, but it's not called tumid lupus. Anybody know? REM, yeah. REM, yeah. On the chat, you can look yeah. exactly like it. Just like one large. I thought it was more like. It can look just like. Particular. It can okay. look just like. And that's, 
Well, I don't think it's really the se a special disease. Okay. I think it's probably Parts a variant to that. <coughs> now, real quick, what are some of the other items you have to put in the differential diagnosis of this? I thought about drugs, too. You always think about drugs. <laughs> the drug's not the classic group of entities that gets put in this differential. Um, okay. Um, Well, there's a classic, you know, we talk about angel and bingo for the painful tumors. There's the so-called five L's. So this would be one of the types of, one of the L's, lupus is one. I think it's really about eight L's. But you think about like a, uh, you know, CLL, lymphoma, uh, lymphocytic infiltrative yesner, quote unquote, which is really probably a waste basket that includes this, includes gyrator erythema. Might even include Lyme disease, so I have that as an L, but Lyme generally has plasma cells and lymphocytes. Photo uh, polymorphous light eruption can look just like this. And then sometimes Hansen's disease, and, and of course you have to put movies in just about anything. So those are all the things to think about there. Okay. All right. Let's give this one a go. Whoever, I can go. This should be a Schnell Rapid. Rapid. Uh, <laughs> All right, so Rapid would be, I think it, this is BP. Nice. <laughs> and why? <laughs> so that was Rapid, but now <laughs> let me explain. Now you got to explain why. Now the explanation. So when, when I saw this, um, First of all, what is striking is, I, I saw the first cut and I, I thought first from high power, uh, low power, that it was there was a lot of um, dermal edema close to the epidermis, but then uh, upon better and closer look, uh, there's almost pretty much like there's a detachment of the epidermis. Yeah, there's a true subepidermal yeah. blister here. Mm -hmm. So when you're diagnosing subepidermal blister. Looking at your yeah. so what's what are sort of the criteria? What do you use to help determine whether it's pepto or one of the other? Well, <laughs> one of the things was the, the presence of an infiltrate. Yes. And the second thing within the the inflammation, the presence of eosinophils. Yeah, the type of cell in the infiltrate. This one had a lot of eosinophils. Yes. Now, did it have only eosinophils? No. What else did it have? Well, there were some uh, lymph, uh, lymphocytes and some, I thought I saw some neutrophils. Yeah, you definitely saw some neutrophils. There's a lot of them. Is that characteristic of pentagoid? Uh, I wouldn't feel that I could say no to that. I mean, it's the, the common thing is to see EOS. I mean, I guess you can see um, uh, neutrophils, but I, I probably uh, would associate just the presence of neutrophils with other things like probably EDA or things like uh, that are not what, directly BP. Yeah, right. Most of the time in uh, pentagoid, you don't get a lot of polys, but you can. So that's kind of somewhat educational about this case because it's got lots of EOs, but it has quite a few neutrophils also. So when you see mostly polys, what are some of the things that you think about? Uh, well, you can think of EB, I mean, in silver epidermal blister, you can think of EBA. Yeah, EBA is one, you can't get polys in um, that. But you, that's not the first thing you should think about. Um, probably you can think of, uh, like, neutrophilic diseases. But they're not really sub epidermal blistering mm -hmm. diseases, are they? Not necessarily. Yeah, the answer is no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, bullos sweets, maybe. But there's or about pulling. there's two <laughs> other obvious ones though that when you think uh, of subepidermal blistering and neutrophils, you should think of two things instantly. Like DH. Yeah, DH, and then. Um, and then. Oh, uh, linear IgA. Liga. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so mostly polys. Think of those. Sometimes you can get some EOs in those conditions, especially in the later stage of DH. I mean, if I would have seen this, I would have said, "Wow, this might be DH with EOs." But the immuno here was was pentagoid. So this is an unusual case in some way. What else can be neutrophils with such a dermal blister? A very important condition to remember. So the dermal. There's one more on that differential. Yeah, that's right. 
You didn't um, even know the other one. I thought you might have said it a second ago. I well, but um, PCT shouldn't have. You can get it in PCT. That's good, but that's rare. But yeah. that's not the one she's thinking of. Um, she's thinking of something like we just saw a second ago. Lupus. So that's the other one in the differential where you get mostly polys. You usually don't get EOs in that one. You can't okay. really get in the other one. So this was bolus passively. But it's a little bit unusual. And you're right that if you see polys, it's a little bit more common to see that with cicatricial pentagoid and also with EDA than traditional bolus pentagoid. Although it can happen. Okay. Another kind of, at this point, review. Okay, so here we have a shave biopsy, and what stands out that you're in that low power is these columns of parakeratosis with just, well, you can't tell that it's keratotic cells here, but yeah, look it's closer. It's a little hard to see mm -hmm. in the low power, but as we go to higher magnification, mm -hmm. we see them. So what is the diagnosis? Porokeratosis. Okay, good. Now, is every... <laughs> Thing that has a coronary lamella, poro? No. No. Good. Of course you know the answer. <laughs> so where else can you see uh, coronary lamella and it's not poro? Vision lesion? I don't support that would be poro. Um, I mean, there's the different variants of Poro, but other than that... Yeah, where it's really not Poro, where it's a fake Poro. I should have so-and-so called the other day and said, this is no way it's Poro. Well, I, I think it actually was Poro. <laughs> but he, no, he said, oh, no, it couldn't be Poro. Well, Poro looks like a lot of things. <laughs> Poro fool a lot of good clinicians, I'll tell you that much. But there are some conditions where you can get so-called coronoid lamellation. Just like you can get granular cell reaction pattern, you get coronoid lamella. With the discaratotic keratocytes too? Yeah. Ooh. Same thing. Mm. So there's a few things that you should know. So warts can do it. AKs can do uh, it sometimes. I thought it was, I thought this was like a poro with an AK. I, I thought it, there were areas where I was talking with Greg about this and I, I, I thought in some areas of the epidermis it looked like completely. Yeah, not, not, not like the, the architectural structure of the epidermis was kind of like jumbled and, and I thought maybe it's a combination of AK and... Well, and if it were that, then what's the diagnosis most likely going to be? Decept? Yeah, decept. Although there's not really a lot of AK here. See, this lot is a sort of tangential section. Okay. But no, this is just a, this was just poro. But there's... The other thing is sometimes you'll see coronary lamellation people with Grover's disease. There's about five or six entities. And actually, if you look up in the literature, there's about 15 or 20 entities where they talked about the coronary lamella, lamella formation, that it's not always seen in poro. So just remember that you can get coronary lamellation when it's not really poro. Most of it is, 99.9 .9 times it is, but sometimes it's, it's not always. Okay. Yeah, there's the four pictures. Okay. All right. Who All wants right. to give this one a go? So we have a little shave biopsy here. Uh, this then... is one where the board's going to expect you to get the answer pretty fast. Yeah, so there's a... This might be a code across. So flash this up on the screen. So you're a... supposed to get a quick Schnell diagnosis again. So what, what's the answer? Uh, angiokeratoma. Angiokeratoma. So you got that part right. Then you look down at your paper. And then they have a question. What disease is it? Which diseases are associated with this? Fabrase. Fabrase is one. There's two others. That's the one I know. Yeah, you got, you got one. <laughs> so you get a C. You want to bring it up to an A, you got to get the other two. One guy got it in Houston the other day. All the rest of them missed it. What's the, there's, there's a second one that you should probably know just kind of off the top of your head. Alpha L fucosidosis is the other one that's classically reported with this. And there's one last one that's reported with it also. 
I'm, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but the board likes to ask these sort of trivial, ridiculous <laughs> questions that are meaningless that you're supposed to keep in your brain, but I know everybody's used to just Googling everything these days, but the board doesn't let you bring your PDA into the exam room. Beta sialidosis, I think, is the other one. Sialidosis is the other one that's associated. So if you get a lot of angiokeratomas, they can be associated with systemic illnesses, so you, especially in the right setting. Now, what's the clinical presentation of fabrics? What, what, what's the symptoms of that? Are they just going to walk in and have a lot of angiokeratomas and say, hi, how are you doing? What's, what's going on here? Not necessarily. No. <laughs> what kind of symptoms do they present with? Uh, they can have abdominal pain. Yeah. They can have like this lancinating uh, abdominal pain. I mean, they, it's they can be pretty sick. Pain. Yeah. Neurologic, neurologic disorders. So, so make sure, sure you know um, the syndrome. Mm -hmm. They like to ask those. Okay, so they're pretty straightforward. At least. But of course, there's the clinical scenarios, obviously, you know, the three different types of the clinical scenarios, the widespread, the ones that look like caviar spots. Okay, so here's another one. They wouldn't expect you to have a lot of trouble with the diagnosis here. Um, so, uh, shape up, um, and there's a lot of acanthosis, um, and I thought that there were some enlarged blue cells um, and some overlying um, orthokeratosis too. Um, this one. Is it a neoplasm or inflammatory? I thought it was, it was benign. Good, um, benign neoplasm. Mm -hmm. What kind of differentiation? Um, I thought it was kind of verrucous type. It is verrucous. It looks like a wart. You're right. Um, what kind of differentiation are we looking at? Um, they have a tricholoma. Yeah. Maybe somebody with a little angel whisper something in the yes. middle of it. Very nice. <laughs> okay, that's not what I Give a little <laughs> angel <laughs> presence. Thank you, angel, for bailing you out here. Yeah, this is tricholimal. And we talked about tricholimal. What does that mean? Trichy. I mean, from the hair. Yeah, the hair, the sheath, the the outer root sheath of the hair follicle. So this is different for the tricholimal outer root sheath, which has these pale cells. What's it, what's inside these cells? Uh, Biochemically, why is that a white paler cell than say this granular cell up here near the top of the epidermis? Um, I'm not sure if it's a secretion or a keratin. Okay, anybody want to help her out on that? Glycogen. glycogen, yes. So if you want to stain for glycogen, what stain do you do? Um, like PAS. PAS. And if you want to prove that it's glycogen as opposed to something like a complex mucopolysaccharide, like in the cell wall of a fungal organism, what enzyme can you put on it? Um, it's in your mouth also when you take a bite out of the to a bagel or a donut in the morning and it starts digesting it right away because it's got lots of glycogen in that donut, that sugary coating that you're eating. Um, you don't eat donuts, though. No. <laughs> Scones, maybe, right? Scones. <laughs> Scones, yeah. Um, it's, so, um, it's like a glycogen that's in your mouth. Anybody know? Diastase. Diastase. We're talking about PAS positive, diastase sensitive, meaning that you put the diastase on, it goes away, or diastase resistant, meaning that it doesn't go away after diastase. I haven't ordered diastase in 30 years, so you don't need it. If you have good eyes, you don't need any of that garbage. But anyway, if you, if you, anyway, so this is a tricholimal veruca, or tricholimoma. Is this associated with a syndrome? I thought it was EDB. That's what I didn't know. Mm. No, there was, there was, no, there was one on the other cut that looked like EDB, yeah. but it wasn't. Yeah. Okay. Uh, was to get a move. Yeah. It's it's good. Good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Dario's really creative this morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, challenge. Is that a is that a new mnemonic? Uh -huh. That's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Because breast cancer too.
So anyway, you have to see success if you think. Here's your, okay, so what else do you see in cavities? So breast cancer, that's why so and then uh, also sorry, go this one. Um so, I'm not sure. Um so yeah, breast cancer, um it's like a neoplastic syndrome. Um make sure you bone up on those. But there's what other skin lesions can you see? Um Anybody know? Lipomas? No. Yeah. Not even, maybe lipomas, but I think it's it's tri trichoeps too. In yeah, not really. Yes, it's more sclerotic fibromas. Remember yeah, that? Yeah. And, and caraway canthomas? Yeah, caraway. Now that we don't call them KAs anymore, we call them all famous LK types, but they're, <laughs> you see those also in Cowden syndrome, multiple KAs, multiple trichomomas, sclerotic fibromas. Do you see desmoplastic trichomoma in Cowden's? No, you do not, interestingly enough. You don't see desmoplastic. And what's the mutation here? What's the general family of diseases associated with this that's in this, in the Cowden's family? Cowden is P10. P10, P10 mutations. And so they like to ask about that. And there's several other P10 mutation diseases, right? Mm -hmm. What are a couple of those? Uh, da, 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 da. My brain, come on. Because <laughs> you're going to have a moo um, for that. <laughs> yeah, Nunes. I think Nunes is one. Yeah. Ruben yeah. Kalbab, whatever that is. Banana. 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 So you need to know those two. Mm -hmm. okay, so learn those. Okay. Let's give this one a go. Maybe I do. No? Okay. Not epidermis. Epidermis. There's maybe a reason you aren't seeing it a lot because it's got some, the same, a pretty dense inflammatory mm -hmm. right down here that's got the same tinctorial quality. Oh, yeah, see. now I can see it. Okay, so I see just kind of a pretty dense infiltrate, um, pale cells. Good. Probably maybe histiocytes. Excellent. So shave biopsy of. Mm -hmm. Probably a small papular nodule, and mm -hmm. they decided they wanted just to take a little piece of it. Okay, now I see. Okay, so kind of this power, I see a lot of kind of histiocytes, um, and saw some uh, multinucleated giant cells as well. Good. And they weren't very plentiful. But they were present. So at first, there weren't a lot of them. They were. were they? No. Yeah. So what other cells did you see here? Some eos. Yeah, it's nice when somebody just has an arrow and they point directly <laughs> to them, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's helpful. Yeah. There's some eos. So at first, I wanted to just rule out infection. Um, of course. And then I didn't so what, you, what infection would you be worried about? Deep then? fungal. But there's it's no newts, so good, that's the problem. Good, good, good. This yeah. wouldn't be great for deep fungal, no, would it? No, because it's not supportive of cranial There is one infection. This is really a rare thing, so you open the Pandora's box here, so you're going to have to answer it. There's one type of infection that kind of looks like this with some spindle cells in here, with not a lot of neutrophils, maybe a few foamy histiocytes here and there. It almost looks like a tumor, a neoplasm, and it is an infection. It's a little foam in that cytoplasm right there. Anybody know what it is? Without no neutrophils. With no neutrophils. It's got the histiocytes take on kind of a spindly morphology. Okay. This is a hard one to ever get in a million years. Histoid leprosy, yeah. Why do you do it? So what, what histoid. Leprosy. What does histoid mean? This is not histoid leprosy, by the way. Histoid. What does histoid mean? It looks like yes, yeah, it looks like histoid. No, not in that case. Huh. 
I what does histology mean? Go back to med school. Histology is what the tissue. The study of tissue. Yeah. So it basically means it's an inflammatory process that looks like a tumor or tissue. So it looks like that, but it's really an infection. I've seen that a few times. Now that's not what's going on here. Here you do have some multinucleated giant cells here. Some of them actually do have a little bit of foam in their cytoplasm focally. There's some eosinophils. So assuming we did a PAS fight and other stains, and they were all negative, and the patient had one papule and was five years of age, came up within the last six weeks, hmm. what might you think about? And they may have taken a superficial shave because it was a kiddo. But now they take superficial shaves of 80-year-olds, which you don't want to do that. If you're taking a biopsy for real diagnosis, don't compromise us by just taking the epidermis and sending it in, which we have lots of people to do, sadly enough. But so what's the diagnosis here? We've got mostly histiocytes, some multinucleated ones, some eosinophils, some spindle-shaped fibroblasts and histiocytes in the lesion. Juveniles at the very in an early evolving stage. Early evolving inflammatory no, stage. No two themselves. That's because it's early. And then I if you give it a little longer, they'll develop. This isn't this doesn't come with the name written on it, JXG. Good. I you have to like know this variant. And this is what happens when they develop in an early stage of evolution. So if you didn't get it right, don't beat yourself up. They probably wouldn't show this on the exam because it is a little bit tough. But this is what they look like when they're kind of in a proliferative stage. They get eosinophil. If you look at the textbook and read about it, it'll just talk about the stuff you're talking about. Giant cells, you know, giant. they won't mention it. So the, my, I was looking for a bug and I didn't see any, so I thought Lewis, the syphilis, as a possibility. Was, oh, syphilis is always a possibility. And then the other one was leprosy um, because there were some, some granulomatose cells kind of foamy and I was like, hmm, is this a weird... <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad you thought about it. So glad no, you really, thought about it. But but you basically, it, you're, you're, should you see? Uh, well, in in Hans's probably would be a different picture. But in syphilis, can you see a picture like this without? It'd be uh, possible, but it'd be pretty. It'd be a little bit uncommon. Okay. It's unusual. But it, it's syphilis can do anything. So okay. if, if you want to be right, if you like to be right, rather than learning, <laughs> just want to be right. Not you can case. always say syphilis and drug free, they can pat yourself on the back and say, I, I got it right. <laughs> you know, I, I've answered those correctly. The best thing to do is say, Hey, I don't know. Teach me. So, this is what happens when you get an early XG. It's got some two time giant cells in here, they're just beginning to form. Mm -hmm. So, it's just it's an early, and a baby that had a chance to form a lot of two time cells. Okay. Now this one, the patch biopsy. Yes. Right. What part of the body? Uh, I think probably scalp. Yeah, it's probably the scalp, or certainly there's a lot of hair. Mm -hmm, and deep hair. And then the scratch. There are two. If three. it's the scalp. Yeah. What does this guy's scalp look like? Probably look like Lawrence's or boggy and. Yeah, it doesn't look good. No. And, if, and if boggy, what else? I mean, uh, is it going to be totally lots of hair shafts? Uh, of hair growth? Alopecia. Well, alopecia, areas of yeah. of alopecia. How many antigen follicles should we see normally here, rooted in the subcutaneous path of deep part? Here's one that's deep. Yeah. How many should we see? Uh, in a, a punch uh, like this. Probably in the range of the 20 to 30. Uh, that's if you cut it horizontally. Okay. If you cut it vertically, how many are you going to see? Probably in a, in a good ten. Eight to ten. Example, if you biopsy Gina, you're going to see eight. Yeah. If you see me, you're going to see probably about five. If you biopsy somebody that's bald, you might see zero. But there's this guy is going to be alopecia. He's got one. Yeah, which is also being attacked. Yeah. And so, what kind of inflammation is in here? So it's mostly neutrophils. Mostly neutrophils. Good. Excellent. So if I saw the the only one that is broken, I could have thought that this was like a folliculitis, a rupture cyst, or something yeah. like that. 
You like ruptured cysts as well, much here? Not really, but no, because it's got like two or three, four follicles that are involved. Yeah. No, exactly. The cyst is going to be like, probably, you could have an right. abscess, but yeah. generally here we've got stuff inside, at least two follicles. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a different ballgame. So what? So base, and then the other one, the one that is alive or still alive in the at the bottom is also being infiltrated. Yeah, there's infiltrated kind of wiping and, out that yeah. area too. You're exactly right. So it's that's probably a ruptured area with granulomatous inflammation. Yeah. So that led me towards more like the folliculitis, folliculitis, the calvans, or Good. dissecting cellulitis. Good. Area. What's the other name? Uh, Perifolliculitis, abscess, then sets of audience. Yeah. Good. Perifolliculitis, capitis, yeah, and perifolliculitis. Folliculitis and perifolliculitis, capitis, and abscess and sets of audience. It's like, if you're in dermatology, you've got to learn at least five or six of these long Latin terms to sound like you know what you're talking about. So yeah, all of those are basically the same deal. What else can start off with suppuration in follicles and they rupture and they end up causing a quiver form area, lots of neutrophils and destroying everything in its wake? Uh, and it, well, anthrax, like the, the staph mm, anthrax can yeah, give it's you... Yeah, suffered folliculitis at first. Okay. We're talking about sterile. Okay. Um, suppuration in follicles that have been all of them get a bunch of them all involved in rupture, and they end up getting a sea of polys and an ulcer overlying. So, da -da -da. it's got a heaped up purple border at the periphery. Uh, let's see if I can get where you're going. Um, you may not, you're probably confused because you don't believe the disease starts out in follicles, but pyloregangrosum. Oh, BG. Early is follicular. Didn't they? Uh, that's a possible yeah. form. I never thought it was a it starts off in follicles, it gets super early, okay. and so the tetrad is hydrocinus separativa, septicellulitis, polynocinus, pyrimogranosum. What else can give you this that you would worry about here? Would you, would you be concerned about an infection? Uh, well, probably. Yeah, you should. You should. You want to make sure it's not like AFB, <coughs> you have suffered a folliculitis mm -hmm. and separation diffusely with AFB, hygienic bacterial infections. Fungus, so lots of stuff into this other than the secondary life. So you probably want to work that out with uh, special stains. And that's a good classic example of what it looks like. Sometimes you push here and pus comes out of here. You know, it's, it's really a terrible disease. Okay, we got a little teensy tiny thing here. All right. Well, I don't think it's human. Good. <laughs> I know some humans are probably fit the description of this. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I thought this was too big to be um, like a mite. Um, I saw what I thought was muscle and maybe some like blood and it's gut, I guess, there. Yeah, yeah I, wouldn't, I think you may be right. Um, there's some red cells there. I, What's this little thing look like? Uh, maybe, maybe an appendage, an arm. Yeah, it kind of looks like a little claw, like a lobster. Claw, yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's muscle here. Yeah. You're right about that. So if we did a PAS stain of this, would it be positive? Mm, no. Yeah, it would. This is called a chitinous exoskeleton, and what's the chitin comprised of? Oh, well, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of like a complex carbohydrate, yeah. basically. It's like sort of like keratin in a way, and it, it would be a PAS positive diastase <laughs> resistant. So it would be positive if you wanted to do that. Nobody would, I didn't write mine or a PAS stain on something like this. So what organism was this? So if that's a claw, then it's probably a, a louse. Yeah, which one? Which one has the claw? Um, the claw is the pubic. Yeah, louse. the crab louse. Because it looks like a crab. You have a picture of it. There you go. See, there's a little claw that you're looking at. It's kind of cute. So on the board, <laughs> they're going to put. So they, they probably would never show you this on the board. But if they did, 
they might put some things like tungiasis in the differential. So what would tungiasis look like? Tungiasis, so you would hope to see epidermis that it was inside of. Yeah, it's like a little it's cyst. It looks, like a, it looks like it's praying mantis in a way. It's yeah. a flea. And it's big. So you have long legs, looks like a flea. What if they uh, put scabies? Does this look like scabies? You're right, it's way too big for scabies, <coughs> number one, but it's also scabies that have a little claw. And you know, scabies, and you, don't see, you can't see mites free like this, but they they look different. They look like little sort of trilobites in a way, I guess, or sand crabs somehow. They, they don't have a claw like this, so they look different. Okay, so that is what diseases cause this. So that's what they got at. Is it, are, are lice associated with disease? What diseases does it cause? Yeah, we just know the various vet diseases that lice cause. Crab louse, maybe not as much, but other things that you need to be aware of that lice cause, or ketiosis, things like that. They like to ask that. Okay, this one. What do you say, low power? Um, uh, sorry, a punch biopsy. Um, you see much of anything in low power? I, no, I didn't see too much. I thought maybe it was square doll, square shape, but my, I, I thought that that was just. I don't think that's part of what's going on. No, you're right. Um, so when you get, so what's the pattern here? Um, it's there's epidermal involvement. Yeah, just kind of basically a very sparse, super spray vascular types, almost no pathology, low power. Mm -hmm. So there is a differential, right? So how do you approach that? Um, if there's very little going on. Yeah, you want to ask yourself things like, could it be a pigmentary disorder? Is it process of the epidermis primarily? Is it maybe a sparse mast cell condition like TMAP? Is it mostly telangiectasis? Is it possibly an anidoderma or something like that where you just lost the elastic fibers? So those are all the things you can think about when you just don't see much of anything at low power. Mm -hmm. So with the higher power, did you actually see anything? Yeah, I thought I did. I thought that um, the stratum corneum. Good. Um, there was did you think? Or were you like absolutely certain 100% that there was something abnormal about the stratum corneum? I was pretty sure there was something. Pretty there. sure or like 100% <laughs> I'm certain? I'm never 100% spot. Without no equivocation. Okay, no. 100% there was. Little balls in the there was balls. there were yeah so there's absolutely positively abnormality up here and what abnormality were you seeing here? Um, I thought it was a pterosaur. Yeah, spaghetti, spaghetti and meatballs. Balls. So little pterosporum or what's the other name for it now that it occurs in its malassezia. Okay, which is so what's the diagnosis? Mitinia brisco. Good, excellent. And is that epidermal pigment normal? Seems a little bit washed out. We have one of the world's experts on pigmentary disorders in the room with Wani. <laughs> so why is it lighter, Wani? What do you think's going on? There's actually a whole literature on this. So the, um, the malassezia produces um, a substance that inhibits the pigment. Yeah, so what substance is it? Azelaic acid. Yeah, azelaic acid. But notice also, it sort of produces azelaic acid, but if you look carefully at the organisms, they have a brownish color to them. What's the brownish color? Melanin. Yeah, it's melanin, just like the other dematiaceous hyphae. Fungi can do that. So it is thought one of the theories is that the azelaic acid depletes the melanin. Some people say it's a melanin, a melanin transfer from melanocytes to keratinocytes, but it's uh, there is a whole literature on that. It's, it's interesting. So this is tinea versicolor. And the next time you're not going to say you think you see something. You say there's unequivocally <laughs> things in the stratum corneum here. Diagnostic. <laughs> so whenever you have a chance, like LeBron James, and you're dribbling down the court, okay. and there's no one in front of you, what does he do? He slams it for as hard as he can. Or throw it off the backboard to yourself. You can do that too if you really want to be a hot rod. You know? <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you have a chance to slam dunk it, you always do that. So many times we have to hedge stuff. It's so much fun when you call something 100% definitively without having to hedge. Okay, another relatively easy review slide for you. 
So here we have, I mean, like, see, the dermal contents. And it looks like a cyst. It is a cyst. And the lining. So how do we name cysts? By the lining. The lining. Good. We've already had one cyst this morning. Mm -hmm. So what cyst are we dealing with here? So this cyst has this kind of pink cuticle, sharply Good. demarcated cuticle. Or and what's the tooth actual tooth. sort of contour of the cuticle? Shark tooth. Good. I like shark tooth. I'll buy that. I like jaws. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I would say that kind of corrugated. Mm -hmm. Another way. Corrugated. Good. And there are some spacious uh, glands opening directly into the cyst. Good. As well, so this is a steatocystoma. Okay. Now, does the patient have a syndrome? If you can you tell if the patient has a syndrome based on this? No. No, you can't. This could be a one solo, one, yeah. or it could be multiple. What's the mutation? It's pachyonychia congenita, and mutation is keratin 6, 8, 6, 7, 7, 8, 6, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, 6, 7, 8, this, that gene is important for a lot of other things. Um, it's, it's involved in, in the many different uh, embryologic sort of developmental uh, processes, and it's kind of curious that you can get a defect in it, and it doesn't cause all those systemic abnormalities in most people. It causes only the cyst, and that's kind of a puzzle to geneticists. They say, well, why, if this thing is gone, don't they get those things in every case? They, they don't always get that. Now, can you make the diagnosis if you just have this area only? No. Yes, you can. Okay. Uh, do not <laughs> okay. say that you need to have the, the, the actual sebaceous glands in the wall to make the diagnosis. If you see that corrugated okay. lining, you can still call it. Okay? All right. Good. Okay, we got a couple more. And Couple more minutes. Uh, these are all pretty simple for you guys today. Wow. Well, so this has you know, the shape biopsy with like some sort of trabeculated, if you Good. want. Excellent. Uh, articulated. Or, or articulated. Is this vertical or horizontal in its orientation? This is vertical and horizontal? But mostly horizontal. Notice they're kind of parallel to the epidermis. Okay. It's yeah. kind of plate-like. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And what kind of cells are we looking at here? So we are seeing uh, basaloid cells yeah. that are extending in strands and forming this network. So what's the diagnosis? So uh, the first thing that you may go with is pincus. Good. Fibroepithelial tumor of pincus. Notice the stroma Pretty fibrotic, right? Mm -hmm. Fibroepithelial yeah. tumor. And what's the clinical presentation of this? Usually is a like a pink uh, or skin color Good. tumor in the in the lower back area. Good, perfect. And so is this what's the best treatment of this? Surgery. What kind of surgery? Like <laughs> Excision. Excision, okay. Yeah. Why wouldn't, would you D and C this? Um, well, it's... Mm, it doesn't respond don't. as well to D and C because of the fibrous tissue in the yeah, case. It's I think so it's better, be, like, better to excise size. this into to D and C it because it's got the fibrous okay. component. Okay. Okay. Now, there are two other entities that you should at least briefly think about when you see this path. Yeah, um, we talked about a few weeks ago. My memory now is fake. Oh, so, no. so we have young memory. So we have, um, yeah, there. Um, hold on. What if these women weren't very Mascaro. okay? Good. What's the other name for Mascaro's entity? Yeah, uh, it's. Uh, it's coming. <laughs> I like Mascaro. He's a good guy. It's, it's but, in the middle of it. Cerebrofibrinoma, which is there's a little uh, eccrine sweat units that also yeah. do this. And there's one or two other things that you should quickly think about. And then... Um, what if these were more kind of 
keratinous, uh, more squamous in their morphology. It looks a little bit more like the continuum of the follicles as opposed to the lower inferior portion of the follicle here, like the basal layer. Oh, and then, uh, yeah, sometimes um, there's another type of BCC that can... Well, this isn't a BCC, though, I'm thinking. Yeah. Yes, oh, TFI, TFI, tumor of the follicular continuum. It's also a plate like, horizontally oriented. But the last it. thing is if you see this overlying dermatofibroma, mm -hmm. it's okay. not even a cancer. So that's the other situation. Okay. Okay. So, but TFI, does it usually do the reticulated? Yeah, oh, really? but it's not basal. Okay. That's, that's the difference. Okay. All right. At the shave biopsy, and here the epidermis is really, really thin. Yeah. Uh, and I can see. What's the main pattern? Inflammatory or neoplastic? Uh, inflammatory. Good. And what's the main pattern? Um, it's pretty sparse. I guess it's a superficial perivascular. There is superficial perivascular inflammation, but there's also yeah. another reaction pattern that's going on here. That's the main it's pathologic it. process. Remember the nine patterns of inflammatory skin diseases. I'd say the collagen is... Good! Uh, What's abnormal about the collagen? What do you call that pattern? Uh, I'd say it's fibrotic. Close. But there is fibrosing and sclerosing is one of the patterns. So you said fibrosis. So where I just mentioned fibrosis and sclerosis. What's the distinction between those two? The cellularity. Good. And is this cellular or not very cellular? I'd say it's cellular. Well, there, well the, the top part is... Kind of cellular, but yeah, the, I would say. The the so box. what's the definition of sclerosis, histologically? Sclerosis is more... Um, Just like we have vasculitis yeah. definition, we have a definition of sclerosis. It's, it's specific. Uh, so few inflammatory cells. Well, and inflammation is not part of it. It's just looking yeah. only at the, the stroma here for sclerosis versus fibrosis. Anybody know? You're looking at it. Isn't it like the loss of space between the fibroblasts? Well, it's homogenization of the collagen bubbles, thickening yeah. homogenization of the collagen bubbles, mm -hmm. and diminished fibroblasts. Mm -hmm. Fibrosis, you can get increased fibroblasts there. So like NSF does not look sclerotic like this. This is sclerotic. Different pattern than fibrotic. I guess so that's what I was trying to say, but I said inflammatory cells and fibroblasts. That's <laughs> okay. That's the main thing is the amount, right? Well, and it's really more of the pattern, really it's more of this stuff. It's really the homogenization of the collagen bubbles and the, you know, with no fibroblasts. That, that's really the main thing, it, it, you don't get that in fibrosis. You get a lot of inflammation, you can get inflammation in sclerotic conditions. So what's the diagnosis here? So with the, the sclerotic collagen and then with the, I was kind of going back and forth between like Lichen sclerosis, but then also radiation dermatitis because the all the vessels okay, that are that's not unreasonable to think between those two. And, and this is there. lichen sclerosis this time. If you have radiation dermatitis, generally you tend to get a lot of bizarre irregular fibroblasts, which we really don't have here. So you get stellate irregular fibroblasts, but that, that's the differential at least if you're thinking about those two entities. So this time it was LSNA. So I thought I saw kissing vessels on the. Is this the only cut? Is that another, another cut? Yeah. So over there, I saw some weird vessels there. Well, yeah, the blood vessels do get kind of dilated mm -hmm. in LSNA. Okay. You get bullous LSNA, where okay. the vessels, you know, actually get it, it, it's rapsexual rip precise. I guess okay. it probably could be a real blister here. Okay. So yeah, you can dilate blood, blood it, vessels so in okay. LSNA, and a lot of times it's just because of the location. Okay, too. okay the last one. So for this one, I thought that there was there were changes mainly in the dermis. Good. Um, I saw lots of spindle cells. Good. Um, I thought I maybe saw collagen dropping too. Um, so I thought about the um, spindle like tumor different differential. Um, so I thought about DFSP. Um, okay. A Good. A AFX not a normal. Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Any of those are theoretically possible. Which type of melanoma would this be? A-melanotic. It would be a-melanotic, yeah. 
it'd have to be a sarcomatoid melanoma. It'd be a very unusual variant, and, and there really was not a lot of striking satellite activity here, right? Mm -hmm. So that would militate strongly against AFX or MFH. So these cells are arranged in these fascicles here that interweave. <coughs> what's the what's that pattern called? It's the honeycomb. Well, we see the honeycomb when it's in the fat, but storiform, like basket weave. Fascicles of spindle cells that interweave, that's called the storiform pattern, and that's seen classically in dramatic fiber sarcoma protuberans. The honeycomb is when you see it in fat. You don't have enough fat here to, to see the honeycomb pattern. It's kind of replaced to be fat if there was fat down here. But notice there's really not any good collagen trapping here. It's just diffuse spindle cell neoplasm with these fascicles of cells here. What's staying? What's the mutation? Uh, 17 and 22. And what is, gets transposed when you put 17 and 22 together? Um, uh, I'm not sure. Anybody um, know? What gets transposed when you... What, what genes get transposed together with that 17 to 22 translocation? Mm -hmm. That could be a ring chromosome. Sure. Call plus platelet-derived growth factor beta, and it turns it into an oncogene that causes these cells to produce dramatically, and that also can be responsive to Gleevec. Mm -hmm. so you can treat these patients with Gleevec before you do um, surgery, and that's what it looks like clinically, multi nodular sort of plaque-like. All right, questions? Mm -hmm. All right, good job. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.